Hey folks, welcome to Wolfman's Gaming Den. Today we're covering the tutorial for the game Lines of Lydia, designed by Johnny Pack, artwork by Daryl D. Jones, and published by Bellwether Games. Uh, this is a game designed for two to four players, it's expected to be played in roughly uh, half an hour to about an hour, so it largely depends on the player count in question. Uh, it is basically a game where you get different resources and the objective is that you're going to be converting them into uh, different properties that will score you points at the end of the game. You're going to be sending out workers to do that. There's a, a bag building aspect to it. So you have this draw bag in here and you will start off with a certain set of uh, meeples in there, which will determine what actions you can take at the start. And then you'll be getting more meeples from the game uh, and playing them out as it goes along. Uh, there's an interesting theme in the game as well. So basically you have these coins in the game and Lydia is apparently a part in uh, 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 ancient uh, region of uh, what is considered to be currently Turkey, I think, or Eastern Europe somewhere, uh, where they basically introduced coins for the very first time in recorded history. So that had a significant impact, of course, on how uh, we sort of like buy and sell goods. Uh, and this game uh, basically tries to capture some of that essence uh, through the mechanics in here. So that will uh, initially at the start of the game, you'll be turning goods uh, in to get certain things, but then at certain point you'll be converting uh, them into money uh, and then maybe use the money to get certain things as well. It gives you a bit more flexibility. But that's roughly the gist of the theme itself. Let's start by looking at how the setup for the game works, uh, what a turn structure looks like, what you're doing on your turn, and how we score uh, towards it. There's a couple of minor rule differences if you're playing a two-player game. I'll cover those at the very end of the video. Uh, the bookmark for that will be uh, in here as well. Uh, the game also comes with a whole bunch of different mini expansions. Now, these are just small modules you can just put in uh, in any combination you like. They will add an additional small wrinkle to the game, uh, minor rule updates and so on. I'll be going through the mini expansions uh, at the end of the tutorial as well. So if you want to learn a little bit more about those, stick around. That's going to be coming in at the end of the, uh, end of the video as well. But for now, we'll start off by looking at setup for this game. So to set up the game, you will basically take the main... Uh, game board over here, put it out of the center. Uh, the game uh, version that you have may come with one of these uh, fountain tokens. You put the fountain token over here at the very center. Uh, if you don't have a fountain token, chances are you may have a cardboard piece that basically goes on that same spot over there. Each player will take a play board. Uh, so this is an example of a play board that we're not using, uh, but this is the one that we have set up for ourselves. We'll refer to this one uh, whenever we need to uh, for reference purposes. So take one of the playboards. Each playboard corresponds to a specific color, which you can tell uh, over here at the very bottom. So this one is green. The one that I'm using is red. Uh, so you can see the color on this particular symbol and that basically denotes the color that you're working with. Uh, on the playboard, you will basically have these different resource tracks going off on the side. You will take the wooden pieces that correspond to each of those resource tracks and put them out over here at the starting space. Uh, which is basically zero. Uh, next up, uh, at the very bottom, this uh, pillar kind of token will go on this track over here where this symbol is printed. And then the golden meeple will go over here on this spot where the golden meeple is printed. So with that, you're basically done with the setup of your player board. Uh, you will then take the uh, starting card in your corresponding color. So in this case, the color we're playing with is red. Uh, the starting cards can, you can tell the starting cards apart because they have this uh, banner on the top left hand side. And this one has the red banner at the top left hand side. There's going to be four of these, one for each player color. So take the one that corresponds to yours and put it uh, on the right hand side of the play board. Now all the cards in the game basically are double sided. So you have this side and you have this side. Uh, this is the side that all, uh, all the cards basically start with. Uh, the ones that have the resources printed at the top over here. Uh, the one with the sort of like uh, the different other banner with the sun symbol and no resources up top. This is considered to be the developed side. It's the more advanced version of the card itself. Uh, but the starting card that we will have will basically start this side up. Uh, and we'll talk about how you can develop the cards later on. So this will go off on the left and uh, right hand side over here. Uh, once each players have set up their play board, they will take one of these draw bags as well. And inside the draw bag, each player will put down one meeple of each color. So basically you're starting off with four meeples, uh, blue, red, uh, green, and yellow. So each player will basically get one of these in their draw bag. Uh, then take these gates 
and put it out in the corner that corresponds to either specific colors. So green goes on green, blue on blue, and so on. Uh, you will take one meeple in each one of the four colors, and one meeple will be assigned to each one of these gates. The one thing you must keep ensure is uh, they don't have matching colors. So uh, yellow could not have gone over here at the starting setup, so it must be a different color uh, compared to the gate. So you have these set up and then take another one meeple of each color and put it out next to the fountain over here in this in a circular area that you see on the gate board. Uh, with that done, we'll now start by setting up the cards going around it. Uh, you, now there are different kinds of cards that the game comes with and I'll quickly pull up the draw deck so that we can have a look at, well, not the draw deck. These are the games, the cards that we're not using in the game, uh, but we can see how this one works. So uh, there are three different kinds of cards in here. So you have the silver cards. Uh, which basically have the silver banner on the back and side. You have the purple cards, which are easy to tell apart because purple banner is easy to identify. And then there are some cards in here, which will be the golden cards. So you have these uh, and they will more, look more yellow in color compared to the silver ones. Uh, the silver ones look more gray uh, to me at least. Uh, so the way that this will work is you're gonna separate all of these out by their different uh, colors. So you're gonna have three stacks. You will shuffle all of the three stacks uh, independently by themselves. Then you will take one golden card and put it on each side of this uh, board over here. So we have one golden card here, one golden card here, one here, and one here. Rest of the golden cards will be put aside. They're not gonna be used in the game. Uh, and it is done randomly. Each golden card will then be assigned one of these golden meeples on top of it. So it's, these are similar to the ones that we put on the play boards as well. So each one of these has one of these assigned on it. Uh, then from the purple deck, you're going to take uh, two cards for each side of the boards and you're going to put it over here. So we have two purple here, two here, two here and two here. Rest of the cards will again go back to the box. They're not going to be used. Uh, and then uh, three silver cards will be assigned to each side of the game board. Same philosophy. Whenever you're putting out uh, all the cards in these sort of like area around the board, they will always be on the, I'm going to call it undeveloped side up. So, you know, these are going to be the ones that have... Uh, the resources printed at the top and that of course if you flip it over it's a developed side on the other end uh, because the developed side always has more points will usually give you more benefits and does not have a resource cost so everything is going to go on the undeveloped side up for all the different cards that go out around here uh, and with that we basically have this side of the game board now set up uh, lastly take all the different coins that the game comes with uh, and put it off on the side uh, we're going to be using those as the game goes along as well but we're not starting with any of those uh, for now. So with that said, that's pretty much the starting setup of the game. Now in this game, uh, there's going to be a few different things that will happen on your turn. Basically what you're doing is uh, the flow of the game is pretty simple. Uh, you're going to take your draw bag uh, without looking inside. You will uh, randomly draw any one meeple. So I'm going to put my hand in here uh, and let's say I'm going to draw one. So I drew a yellow one. Now you're going to put your uh, meeple out onto the game board over there, which will allow you to do certain things. Uh, if you put it out next to any one of the gates, it generally allows you to get resources. If you put it in the central area over here, it usually allows you to turn resources into, uh, your, basically allows you to buy the cards and do certain things around the table. Uh, and then once you're done your, with your action, you will take uh, one of the meeples from around the fountain area and you will put it back in the bag. Uh, so you will always have four uh, meeples to draw from at the start of your turn. That is roughly the flow in a very simple nutshell uh, for the game itself. Now, uh, what do the, each of the individual actions correspond to? So drawing a meeple is easy enough. You're going to look and you're going to draw. We already did that. There is not much to it. Uh, once you have in, so let's look at how we can get the resources. So the first option is you can put one of your guys out on these particular spots over there. So I might, let's say for example, take this one and put it out next to this gate. So now in this particular area, we have a gate and two different meeples. This will allow us to start collecting different resources. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll bring out a red one because I want to show it with another example uh, in here. So let me see if I can fish the red one out. Uh, here we go. So let's say I drew the red one out uh, and I'm going to put the red meeple over here next to a red gate and a yellow meeple. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to see if the cards that you have laid out uh, on the right hand side, your property cards, they're called, allow you to gain particular benefits based on where you have placed it out over here. So the reason why I did the red and red example is because, of course, we are the red player color. So this 
corresponds to a particular benefit that corresponds to our player color. So what this basically says is if you ever have, once you put your worker out, a red worker at a red gate, uh, you will gain a red resource. I'm, I'm just going to call them by the colors. They have uh, names, but color I'm guessing is going to be easy enough. So in this case, we've actually met the condition over there because we put out a red meeple that's right next to a red gate. So check on this one. We have met this requirement. So this basically gets us one red resource. And the way that we're going to keep track of that is by moving this marker to the right one space. So this tells us that we now have one of that resource. Once we're done with that, we will now start collecting resources based on what this area generally allows us to do. So that basically means we will now look at all of the different colors that correspond to this area. So we have one red gate, one red meeple, and one yellow meeple. So generally speaking, that's two reds and one yellow. So basically we're gonna move up red twice, so one and two, and then yellow once, and then yellow moves up over here like so. So that basically ends up giving up resources when we do that particular action. Now, this is what happens if you put out a, a regular colored meeple, one of the four colors. If you were to put out a, and we're gonna pretend that maybe we were putting out a golden meeple uh, on any one of the player boards. So let's may, maybe if we put out a golden meeple over here, let's say, uh, if we were to do this, uh, we still get the resources based on the requirement that we just spoke about. So you still get one yellow, one blue, uh, but this allows you to convert resources into coins. And the way that that will work is uh, you will look at uh, the color of the gate itself, which right now it is yellow. Uh, we have one of the yellow resource. Uh, so you will be able to convert the one yellow resource into one coin. And this basically comes over next to your play area over here, like so. And then you can use this as a wild. Whenever you have to pay any one resource cost in the game, a coin is considered a wild, so they can be pretty, they can give you quite a bit of flexibility in terms of the actions you can do on your turn. Uh, so that's the difference that happens if you were to put out a golden meeple instead of any other colored meeple. Few things to keep in mind, you have a max limit of 12, so you can never have more than 12 coins. So that's uh, one thing that you uh, must take care of. Uh, when you're uh, paying this particular colored resource to get the coins, you must pay all the ones that you can uh, are able to pay. So for example, if I had three over here, I cannot choose to pay two or just pay one and basically leave it there. I must use up all three and then I would basically get the three coins when I do that, uh, which is fine because of course it's a wild, so it gives you a lot of flexibility. The other thing you want to keep in mind when you're collecting resources is that uh, the play boards are actually all maxed out over here. So you cannot have more than six of any of these different resource types. Uh, so if you were to ever get anything in excess of that, it is always wasted. So, you know, you would never have eight of these. If I was at five and I got three, I would only move up to six. Uh, the other two would be considered uh, lost basically at that point. Now, uh, this would also be a good time to talk about some of the benefits on these corners over here because you will see that the six spots correspond to these things over here like so. Uh, and whenever you move to the very rightmost spot on any one of these, you can take one of these two benefits. Uh, the rightmost benefit is easy enough to understand. You would basically uh, flip any undeveloped card that you have, which is basically something that still requires a resource that's on the lesser side up, you can for free, and this is for free, you can flip it over to the developed side up. So as a, if I had this one, I can flip it over to the developed side up and I can do that as a benefit for this one. And you can only do this when you are moving to this particular spot. Uh, the other benefit that you can pick up is uh, you can move your, this marker one space to the right. So let's look at our player board over here. Uh, right now we are over here. We'll bring our golden meeple back because uh, this is what the starting setup was. So you would basically move this one step to the right. The reason why this is important is because whenever you're moving this, it helps you unlock additional benefits, including points uh, towards the end of the game, uh, but it also gives you certain benefits. So let's understand what, how this track works. So the very first one basically has three with cards on it. So what this basically tells us is we can only ever have a max of three property cards at any point in the game. We start with one, so if we're still here, we can maybe get up to two more, uh, but anything beyond that, we would not be able to acquire. Uh, this meeple is here, so if we were to use this particular benefit, uh, this would move over there. What that means is that this is now unlocked. Whenever this is unlocked, it basically goes to the central fountain area over there. Uh, so you don't get it. It goes to the common pile that you can pick up from on a future turn. Uh, additionally, you will see that this spot has five printed on it. So now the number of properties that you can have has gone up to five. 
If you were to go to this part over here, uh, you can now have up to eight properties and you also get two money or two coins rather at the same time. Uh, if you move over here, nine plus basically means you can have any number of properties. There is no upper cap. So you can have 10, 12, 13, whatever uh, sort of like you're able to get. Uh, and of course, this also gets you three coins at the same time as well. If you move over there, you will score four points at the end of the game. You, over here, you will score 10 points at the end of the game. Here, you will score 18 points at the end of the game. Uh, what this will also allow you to do is you can now start using a red resource as a wild whenever you have to. So this corresponds to your player color. It gives you that one-off buff uh, whenever you're doing those different actions. So uh, this can give you uh, immediate benefits and then, of course, more and more points and uh, stronger abilities as you move it further to the right-hand side. So whenever you get one of your resource markers to the very right-hand side over here, remember, you can develop a card for free, one card for free, or you can choose to move one of these markers one space to the right and then get that corresponding benefit. Uh, once you've taken this benefit, the marker does not move to the left automatically. The only way it will move to the left is when you spend the resources. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind, which of course brings up to a nice little segue. How do you spend the resources now? So that's a good question because this takes us on to the second action that you can do on your turn. So the first action that we spoke about is uh, you can put your meeple out on any one of these four spots and gain resources in a few different ways. Uh, if you draw a meeple from your bag, you can also, however, send your meeple uh, out over there uh, and you can do the action of this particular fountain, which is basically you can now acquire cards from around the game board area. And you want to acquire cards because that's going to be a major way you're going to build your engine as well as score points at the end of the game. So let's look at how the acquire card action works. You will basically pick any one side of the board and you can acquire up any number of cards that you are able to acquire that you can pay the cost for. Uh, this is easy, well, somewhat easy to understand because uh, the way that you would acquire the cards would be quite simple. Uh, the cost that you see printed at the very top of these cards on the undeveloped side, uh, and these actually should be on the undeveloped side up, so ignore uh, these for rules purposes. That's an error on my end. Uh, but uh, this would basically come in on the undeveloped side up, so it would be something like this over there. You would pay the cost printed at the top over here, so this is two yellow resources and one red resources. So if I had maybe something like this at the start of my turn, I'm going to move down two on the yellow and one on the red. I'm gonna take the card and I'm gonna put it over here like so. Uh, this will do a few different things for me. This will now give me three points at the end of the game, even if, uh, if it is on the undeveloped side up at the end of the game. Uh, if I can develop it on a future turn, I can now score six points instead. Uh, and the other thing that it will do is it will give you some sort of an ongoing benefit. So if you remember how this one worked, where we had put out a red meeple on a red gate, uh, and this would have given us one red uh, token. Uh, we can now put out this card over there. So if we're putting out a yellow meeple on either a yellow gate or a red gate, it gives us a yellow meeple. So, and of course, once you develop it, it gives you a more powerful version of that action uh, itself. The number of cards you can acquire from any one of these sides is limited only by the cost that you can pay for it. So after I've done acquiring this, if I have additional cost remaining, I can, let's say for example, I still have three red remaining over here. I can potentially acquire this as well uh, because this has a cost of three red resources. So I could pay the three red resources, uh, move down to zero, and then basically acquire this and bring it over here to the right of my play area as well. Uh, so you can acquire as many cards as you can pay uh, from any one side of the game board. Cards are never replenished, so new cards are not gonna come in and basically replenish these. So you wanna keep that in mind. Uh, these are finite resources in the game. Uh, if you were ever to acquire a golden card, and of course, we had a look at this, a golden card would look something like this, that would have a golden banner. Uh, all of the golden cards also have the meeple on top of them. So as soon as this is acquired, this meeple will basically now go to the central fountain area and it's available uh, for somebody to pick up on a future turn. So this will then come up uh, to your side over there. Uh, so that's basically what you're doing when you're going over there, you're basically picking up the cards. You can also develop cards as part of the same action. And the way that the develop cards will work is once you've acquired all the cards that you can acquire, you will now look at your uh, tableau over here on the right hand side to develop a card, it is the same cost that you paid to acquire the card. So if I wanted to develop this, I would pay two yellows and one red and flip it over to this side. Now I have a more powerful ongoing ability and I have more points at the end of the game. Uh, and I can, 
excuse me, and I can develop as many cards as I'm able to develop on the same turn. So the fountain action basically allows you to buy any cards or as many cards as you can afford from any one side of the board and develop as many cards as you can uh, in your play area over there. Uh, once you have done either the putting your worker out on these, getting resources or putting your worker out over here and uh, buying cards and developing cards, the next step is you will pick any one meeple from this central area, the fountain area, and put it back in your bag. So in this case, we might say, you know, we're because red give, maybe gives us a lot of flexibility because it's our player color, maybe we want red and we're gonna take the red and put it back in our bag. So for the start of the next round, you would always have four to choose from from the bag. Uh, the one thing that I'll quickly mention, which I forgot to mention when you're doing your work action out on these spots over here is, uh, if I were to go, let's say, for example, on this spot now with a yellow worker, I would do my action as per normal. I gain the benefit if for anything that I'm eligible for from this side, I would gain the resources from that spot. Uh, so all of that is good. But if you ever, after you have done this, if you have two workers of the same color, they basically move into the fountain area. Uh, so that's another way in which meeples will then start moving into the fountain area. Uh, and then, of course, it makes you do... Uh, uh, gives you more flexibility in terms of the workers you get from the fountain but uh, yeah that's another thing that's going to happen it also makes sure that you don't have any area that builds up in such a way where you're just getting like a truckload of resources whenever you put a worker out on that particular spot over there so that's basically how a turn structure works you draw a meeple from the bag you either put it out on one of these spots at the gates get resources or you put it out in the fountain buy cards and or develop cards uh, to your side and then at the very end of it, you will draw one meeple from the central area over there. You will continue doing this going around and around the table until the end game condition is triggered. The end game is triggered when players have developed a certain number of cards. And this is variable based on uh, the player count. In a three player game, uh, it's the first player who basically develops seven uh, of these uh, property cards. In a four player game, it's six property cards and in a two player game, it is eight property cards. I will have a screenshot for this down on the right hand side as well so that you guys can have that reminder. Uh, once the end game uh, is triggered, so whoever triggers the end game will pick up the fountain from the central area and they will take it with them. The important thing is that this is gonna give them one point at the end of the game. Uh, at the same time, every other player uh, going around the table clockwise will get one more turn uh, to complete their actions. Uh, once we're all done with that, uh, the game ends at that particular point, and then we start adding up the points uh, for end game. The way that you will look at end game points is you will basically see where your marker on this player board is there on the rightmost particular spot. Uh, you will gain points for those. This is not cumulative. So, you know, if you were on 10, you don't get 10 plus 4, you only get the 10 over there. So, you will gain points for those. Uh, for the silver, golden, uh, and the starting card that you have, you will gain points equal to whatever's printed uh, on the face side up that you have over there. So if it's an undeveloped card, you get the points corresponding to that. If it's a developed card, you get points corresponding to that. You will gain the point for this if you were able to pick this up. Uh, the purple cards work a little bit differently. So you wanna make sure that you keep uh, track of that as well. They're not worth the points uh, printed on the bottom over here straight up. Basically, these are conditional points. So basically what it means is, if you have this card developed onto this side by the end of the game, for every two resource you have left over, they're gonna give you six points. So if you had four, that's gonna be worth 12. If you had uh, six, that's gonna be worth 18. So you wanna make sure that you uh, don't confuse the purple cards at the end of the game with any of the other colored cards because it's a variable uh, scoring on these ones. Uh, so that's basically how you're gonna score for that. And uh, this point over here on the fountain, uh, this is basically one point per coin that is left over. So you wanna make sure that you're not confusing this either. This is not one point straight uh, worth straight up. Uh, if you have five coins left over at the end of the game, the player that who uh, got this, they would score five points uh, for e one point for each of those coins at that particular point in time as well. If there's a tie for points, after all the points are tallied up, uh, the person who's the highest up on the influence track is the winner. So you're gonna see who's highest up on this particular track over here, that person is the winner. And if you're still tied, you will basically add up all the different resources and coins, uh, resources and coins left over. And then whoever has the most of those is the winner at that particular point in time. Now let's quickly run through uh, the differences for a two player game. Uh, basically, there's just a couple of very minor setup changes uh, if you were to play a two player game. 
uh, when you're laying out cards on these areas over there, instead of putting out three silver cards, you're going to be putting out two silver cards on each side of the game board. So that's one difference that happens if you're playing a two player game. Uh, also, uh, the rule book does not say this, but what I've seen in a couple of other forums uh, and places is that uh, at, the starting, uh, at the start of the setup, we had put out one uh, meeple of each color in the central fountain area. Uh, what I've read elsewhere is that it's actually in a two player game, it's meant to be two meeples of the same color uh, around the fountain area over there. So uh, those are the main differences if you're playing a two player game. Basically, it's the number of silver cards that go on to each side. So instead of having six cards on each side, you will have five cards because you will have two silver cards instead of the three. And then you will have uh, two meeples of each color on the around the fountain area over there. Uh, and that's it. That's basically how a game of Lines of Lydia uh, plays out. Uh, hopefully this helps you get the game to the table a little bit faster uh, and has given you a good overview of the game itself with some examples as we went through the teach. Uh, with that said, now let's start by looking at some of the uh, different variants that the game comes with. Uh, the first mini expansion for the game is called uh, King Croesus, and that basically is represented by this meeple over here. The way that this will work is at the start of the game, you will choose any one of the four gates and put this king out uh, right next to it. Uh, anybody who goes over there will basically gain one extra resource uh, corresponding to the color of the gate. So this gives you sort of like uh, one additional resource, uh, an incentive to go to that particular spot. Uh, once you've taken uh, the extra resource from that particular spot and done your action, you will take this guy and move him to any one of the other gates over there. Uh, so you could do something like that basically at that point. And that's basically how this one works. This is going to go around the, uh, uh, the different locations over there. And it will give anybody who goes to the spot that the king is at uh, one extra resource corresponding to the color of the gate itself. Uh, the next expansion that the game comes with is called the Water of Pectolis. Uh, basically what you will do is you're going to take these four different uh, cards and each one of the cards will be assigned to one side of the game, uh, one side of the game area. So they will have uh, six, uh, seven cards instead of six cards uh, the way that we looked at setup. You can acquire these cards the same way uh, that we saw earlier. So you pay the resources up top. You would also score points uh, that's printed uh, on the bottom of the card uh, based on whether it's the developed or undeveloped side up. Uh, the benefit that you get from this is if you have the property and you're taking a fountain action with the color of that meeple, uh, you would gain a coin at that particular point in time. So it could be a nice little coin engine uh, for you to get going if you have these cards in the game. The next expansion that we have is called the Artisan's Guild. Uh, which are basically these meeples out over here. The way that this will work is you're going to take this meeple and you're going to put it on uh, this side up on the fourth spot. Oops, uh, that went down. Let me pick that up. On uh, the fourth spot over here. So once your a marker moves over, you get to unlock this guy and then this guy will go into the fountain area at that particular point in time. Uh, on a future turn, you can pick that up, goes to the bag. If you ever were to put uh, this one out uh, from your bag, onto one of these different play areas. You can choose to match the color of uh, anything else that's present in that spot. So if I went over there, uh, I can pretend this is either green or blue, and then I would gain a green, let's say if I pretended this was blue, I would get two blue resources and one green resources. Uh, if I said this was matching with the green color, uh, this also needs to move into the fountain at the end of the turn at that point, because for gameplay purposes, this is considered for that turn to be of that color. So that's basically how the artisans work. The next expansion that we have are the courtyards, which basically correspond to uh, these different tiles in here, and they correspond to each one of the play colors in the game. So the way that this will work is you're going to take the tile that corresponds to your color. So in this case, uh, uh, we were playing red, so this would be ours. Uh, what you would do is you're going to take a red meeple and put it on top of this one. So uh, maybe something like uh, this, and this goes to the side of your play board over here. Uh, the way that this will work from a gameplay point of view is that this now acts as an extra reserve for you to choose from. So when you're drawing uh, one meeple from your bag, one out of the four that we had a look at earlier, uh, you can either choose to take that meeple and put it out over there and do that action, or you can take the meeple that's over here, put it out over there and do the action as normal. Uh, but the meeple, but if you did that, the meeple you drew now goes on to this particular spot over there. So it gives you extra flexibility in terms of the color of the worker you can put out. Uh, on the game area and do your action. That's the Courtyard's uh, mini expansion. The next expansion we'll have a look at is Al Yeti's Tomb, which are basically uh, these tiles 
this side face up. The other side is a different expansion, which we'll come to uh, in a minute. Uh, but this basically is going to go into the game area. You're going to put out one of these underneath uh, one of the golden uh, cards played out over there. So, for example, this would be underneath this, like here, like so. Uh, the way that this will work is uh, you still acquire the golden card as per normal. So you would still do this uh, the way that you would acquire a card. But after this is done, this style is now available. Uh, and to acquire this style, you would need to pay a cost corresponding to uh, two coins, which are sort of like symbolized by these two coin symbols over there. You would need to pay with a meeple as well. And the way that this will work is you're going to take one meeple uh, of that color from the central fountain area, which in this case is yellow. So you're going to take one yellow meeple and you will put it out over here. Uh, what that basically effectively does is there's now one less meeple in circulation. So there's less, uh, somewhat less flexibility in terms of what meeples may come up uh, of which color. So you're going to do this over there. The other big thing that you will do is, and by the way, this will also score you the points printed over here at the end of the game. The other big thing that this will do is you now retire the token of that resource color immediately. So in this case, this is yellow. Uh, if we were, let's say, for example, if we had four yellow resources, we will take this token and put it out over here. The four yellow resources that we had is lost immediately. Uh, but the benefit that it gives us is basically every single time we were to collect a yellow resource, we will now instead get a coin. So this gives the coin gives us a lot more flexibility over the course of the game. Uh, the trade-off, of course, is that you no longer get uh, the benefit on the sixth spot over here. So you, you, because you don't have that marker, you can never get that one. Uh, but you get some nice points and uh, you get coined whenever you're collecting that resource. So hopefully that gives you a different kind of flexibility uh, for the rest of the game. The next expansion we're going to look at is uh, the Royal Architects, which are basically these tokens over here. Uh, so if you're going to use this in the game, the way that this will work is these will attach to the side of these game areas, all four of them. Uh, I'm just going to attach two of these so that uh, I can present the ex uh, example. Uh, so on your turn, when you're supposed to put out a meeple uh, either here or here to do the action, uh, you can instead go to one of these spots over there. Uh, the way that this will work is, remember, if you went to the fountain, you could acquire cards from any one side of the game board. This allows you to acquire cards from either side of this new fountain uh, tile over there. So I could get cards from here uh, as well as cards from there. So it gives me more flexibility for acquiring the cards. Uh, once you're done with your main action, of course, this moves on to the center of the fountain area as per normal so that it can be drafted from that spot on a subsequent turn. So that's basically how the fountains would work. The next expansion we're going to cover are the Chariot Races. Uh, so this is an extra game board that will be added uh, next to the play area. The way that this will work is whenever you're supposed to move meeples into the fountain when you have matching colors. So for example, if we had uh, two blue over here there and we're supposed to move both of these in, we'll just move one of these in and the other one will go to the leftmost available spot over there. This will happen three times and when it happens the third time, there's an event that is triggered. All the players around the table now have the option to spend resources corresponding to the colors of these meeples to gain benefits. So for example, if we had maybe had one blue, uh, one red, and then maybe we had another uh, a green over there. So you could spend one any one resource corresponding to these colors, so maybe a blue, a red, or a green, and gain one coin. If you were to spend two matching ones, so either a blue or a uh, red, uh, red or a green, or a blue or a green, you would gain three coins. Or if you had one of each one of these three, and so you're spending three resources that match these three spots, you would get to move your marker, uh, the prestige marker, one space to the right on your play board over here like so. Once this is done, all the meeples will now go back to the fountain area the way that they were originally meant to be, and then this is now reset, and then it can be filled up again and used again uh, later on as well. So that's the uh, Chariot Races uh, mini expansion. The last expansion that I will quickly cover is called Estates, and these correspond again uh, to these tiles over here, but now uh, we're going to be looking at the other side of these tiles. So this, if you remember, were the tombs that went underneath the gold cards. Uh, we're now going to be using this side face-up for these tiles. Uh, from a setup perspective, they work pretty much the same way as the other expansion. So basically, they will go underneath uh, the gold cards uh, that you're setting up over the game. So this will go over there, this goes over there, and then you have the golden meeple on the golden card. Uh, from a gameplay perspective, this is uh, becomes available once the top card has been acquired. So it's uh, the same way as the early expansion. So once this is acquired, this is now available to acquire. 
the way that you're going to acquire this is uh, the cost is printed up top over there. So you do have to pay three coins to acquire it. So it can be a little expensive. And once you've acquired it, you will use it to cover up any silver or gold property card that you have on the player side. And the ability of that card no longer matters, but it will score you twice the points of that card. So as an example, uh, if let's say, for example, we had this golden card, uh, and I should also mention this only goes on top of cards that are fully developed. So it cannot be this undeveloped side up. It has to be this developed side up. So the way that this, it will work is I must have either a silver or a golden card that's fully developed. So this could be an example. Uh, and once I acquire this, this will go on top over here like so. So the ability of that card is now covered up. So I no longer get that ability moving forward. But at the end of the game, instead of scoring six points, I'm not going to score six multiplied by two. So 12 points for this combined. Uh, any effect in the game that might be resolved uh, uh, due to developed cards, for purposes of that, this now counts as one developed card, not two developed cards. So the important distinction to keep in mind, but basically it multiplies the points uh, from your fully developed uh, golden or silver cards in the game. And that's the last one. Those are the eight mini expansions that the game comes with. Uh, hopefully it gives you a good flavor of uh, which ones may be of interest to you and which ones you may wanna throw in uh, to add a little bit more spice into the game. Of course, you can mix and match and maybe add uh, more than one into it if you really want it. So, you know, maybe you could do your first game with just the base setup, uh, but then mix and match any which way you want uh, once you're comfortable with it. But that's uh, everything that comes in terms of rules for Lines of Lydia. Uh, hopefully the teach was easy enough for you guys to pick up. If you have any thoughts, comments, suggestions, feel free to leave them down below. Uh, and again, I have uh, more uh, of these tutorials going live every week. So if you want to learn new games, uh, subscribe to the channel. There's going to be more of those coming up and you can stay up to date uh, on those when and as it does. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other board gaming content that goes live as well. So lots of stuff for you guys uh, uh, to keep you guys happy on that front. But in the meanwhile, thanks for watching uh, and I will see you at the next one. Take care.